G'day, good morning, good evening to you. I hope you're well where you are sitting or standing or lying. <laughs> this is a cannabis show, which is a medical cannabis show, which is all about safe practices and using it legally. And I'm talking about all legal practices and all things that relate to the law. I respect the law and I hope that you do too. And that's what my attitude is. So um, if you listen to the show or in it, you'll... um be involved with safe and legal practices thank you it's just over so today i'll put it up add the stream oh no i don't want to see me how do we do the other one this one so this week is on a general chat again but it's a water is a topic that was came up a few weeks ago about water so i thought we'd get on and talk about some water related stuff in medical cannabis and in water in general, because water is, well, our bodies are 70% water. Plants are 70, 75% water around. Um, yes. All right, well, get into it. There's no one's really popped up yet, which is a bit strange, because I like some of the questions. It makes me think, has it actually gone live? But it says it's live. Oh, well. All right. Well, I'll get into it. So, yes, yeah, so that's a water topic. So I'll get and show you the slides. Share screen. Get into the share screen. Allow. Uh, just trying to share screen. And allow. There it is. And you can see on my screen. So we'll go water. That's the first thing. Oh no, I was going to go for a different one. This is my section on plant science in water. So we'll go water relations in plants, root pressure, agitation, aquaporins. Just go on a general, what does water do type thing first. So water is the most important single compound for all living organisms on earth. It has major structural habitat to many plants. It's medium. All right, I'm, not going, to, I'm going to skim through all this because there's a heaps of slides to go through. It helps plants with their cell turgidity, so their water movement through their cells and around their cells. It induces plant movement through stomatal movements and like the mimosa leaf, how it droops. That's actually that's a touch sensation in the mimosa leaf. That's acted on by calcium channels. So you touch the mimosa leaf and it activates the calcium channels, which activates the calmodulin, and that um, turn in turn puts out the signal to shut the leaf. With water movements, it also helps with the sap movement through the phloem in the vascular bundle. Inonization provide hydrogen and proton with charges, phospholipids. Okay, medium uptake. Yep, it helps with all sorts of things, uptake of night, yep. Minerals, solvents, raw material in photosynthesis. Yep. Product of aerobic rest respiration, hydrolysis, dehydration. Right. I'm going to skim through a fair bit of this. It helps with seed germination. Yeah. We all know nearly 75% of our earth is covered with water from oceans and water bodies and ice. Most of it's in ice. Water is the most abundant. Yep. Jellyfish contain 99% water. Watermelons are 96% water. Cucumbers, 96. So, yes, interesting. Water is essential for homeostasis in our bodies. Yes, for our dehydration. Yeah, if, you, if your pee's looking a little bit too dark, that means you're dehydrated and you should be drinking more water. Remember that, because you can get dizzy. Oh, here you go. It can lead to headaches, appetite losses, confusion, tiredness, seizures, and sometimes death. Aquatic plants have most of their weight in water. Water content is extremely poor in dry seeds, as it should be, because that's one of the functions of a seed to germinate. I wonder if I'm coming through. I'm going to actually stop it. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, you can hear me. <coughs> oh, yeah, good. <coughs> oh, there we go. Some good morning, Vinny. How you going, Raymond? Cloud Mysticioles. Hello, hello, 
Dave, 1969. <clears throat> Today's the chat on water and water. So I've got enough slides to really talk nearly by myself about water. <laughs> So if you missed it, that's what it's about today. Coming through good. All right, thanks, Cloudscape. That's good to know. Matt, Rob, how you going, Matt, Rob? You're all fine, says Raymond. Thank you. All right, I'll get back to the water. <coughs> Just, I'm going to briefly go through water on what it does and what it's about, and then I'll get into its relationships in plants because there's stacks here to go through. Uh, what was I up to? This one. Water is tasteless. Yes. That's what it should be. Water should be tasteless, odourless and transparent. So good, clean, nice water has zero taste and zero smell. And that's what I get from my reverse osmosis. I know when there's something up is when I get a little bit of a taste happening and then I should be putting, changing some of the filters or at least investigating further to see what the PPM is and then changing it. Um, if you do have reverse osmosis water in your drink in, as a liquid, remember that you it might be stripping cations out of your body because of its deionized form. So it's water has an attraction to, it has a slight negative charge. So it does attract positive cations. So it can strip things out of your body, just like in the soil. So it's good for flushing, but anyway, I'll get to that a bit later. It's just safe practices. An important water has three atoms. Yeah, it's got two hydrogens and one big oxygen. H2O. Hey, okay. this allows water to be polar. Yes, because the oxy two oxygens have a slight, they have a, oh, I think it's a, like a 300 negative molecular weight and then positive and the hydrogen has a positive 200, which gives a net negative of minus 100 molecular weight, which allows the water molecule to have a negative charge. No, don't want that one. H2O, yep, good. Periodic table, no. Comparison of water and some hydrogen-containing compounds. Uh, not getting into it that deep. No, heat of evaporation. Yeah, well, you, it loses, it's 44 joules of energy, I think, the, when it evaporates. So if it's going to go for evaporation, that's going to increase the heat. Uh, molecular structure, I spoke about that one. All right, so I'm just skimming through these because there's a hell of a lot of them. Oh, there you go. That's about the positive charge. Net negative charge because that's positive and that has a big... Okay, I was, I was wrong with before. So the oxygen is the, has the negative overall and the... Oh, no, that's what I said. Good. Uh, okay, I think... Come on, there's something interesting. I'm going to really skim through this. Layers, water... Okay, it expands, it loses. Oh, this is interesting, I remember. At 4%, at 4 degrees Celsius, pure liquid water expands on heating or cooling. So the maximum density of water, along with ice, is at 4 degrees Celsius. The necessity that at all of a body of fresh water, not just its surface, is close to 4 degrees Celsius before freezing can actually occur. And then you can go into super cooled, like the clouds have to get, they get super cooled and they go negative, have a net negative charge, negative one, negative two Celsius. Um, and that's for the ice to form up in the, the stratosphere. Water, universal yep, solvent, it is. The universal solvent, it's good to wash everything. Anyway, I'm getting a bit of a way off the topic. I just wanted to skim on what water is, what it does, how electrical conductivity. Pure water containing no exogenous ions is an excellent insulator but not even deionized water is completely free of ions. Yes, some people have put plant, um, water around, if you put like a drum and put a hollow in the middle of it, and then or we'll put water bottles around a base of a plant so you can insulate it. So they'll freeze first and then it won't get to the, by the time it freezes, it depends how cold it is, you can't do it's minus 10, but it's around zero, the water bottles freeze first and then the, plant won't get touched and it'll be a little bit later so by the time the sun comes up it hasn't had a chance to go into it what water undergoes on oh, okay 
cohesion tension theory, hydrogen bonding between water molecules makes the molecules want to stick together, which creates, which creates the property of cohesion and causes surface tension. This is one of the theories to get water through a plant. So from it touching to its next one, it'll bond together. And then when it evaporates, it'll pull. So that's the cohesion tension theory for water's getting through the, from the roots out through the stoma, stomata in the plants. Negative side of water molecule attracts the positive side. We formed, oh, here we go. It's surface tension, yeah, how it happens. Because of cohesion, water droplets can fill a glass above the rim. Yes, if you, and they'll be concaved, so it won't be flat. <coughs> Convexed, sorry, not concave, concaves inwards. Convexed is out, surface tension. Yep. This is one of any questions. I'm sure I've got it pulled up on another device here. You can read that and I'll see if there's any questions. Uh, going through good. Matt Raymond. Yeah, I've been wanting a reverse osmosis kit, says Cloudscape. Yeah, they help, mate. My suggestions for reverse osmosis kit is a five stage. Go into um, one of the major online places and search for a five stage because you can get them for about 120 Australian dollars. And if you go to the major region outlets, you'll get a two-stage one for about the same price. Um, so yeah, try and get a five-stage. And then I change my filters probably once every one to two years. I'll spend thirty dollars on it, and that's that's it. Pure water, or not pure, but deionized. The structure is zero to fifty ppm is spring water. No, is deionized reverse osmosis water, and then fifty ppm to hundred is spring water. So most of the spring water that you buy from the bottles, I've tested quite a few, heaps of them, and it comes out at about 95 ppm. Anyway, back to it. Oh, that's right. It was just that question. Uh, that's the kit. Matt Flick. How you going, Matt Flick? I'm just using tap water, says Matt Rob. Okay. And does it need an air stone for 12 to 24 hours? Your tap water uh, has a lot of chlorine in it. So you want to evaporate the chlorine. The chlorine has a, the hydrogen bond that it has between it is a pretty weak one. So it'll evaporate overnight or even um, within 24 hours. So leave your water out, whatever you're going to give to, you, to your girls. And in the States, for you poor folk in Canada, you've got chloramine in your water, in your tap water. Um, and that has a triple hydrogen bond and it's very, very hard to break. So apparently boiling it doesn't even work very well because it just takes ages to get to break that bond. It's really good for safeness to get rid of all of the, because your underground water is pe pesticides and polluted. So that's why they've had to put chloramine in your treated um, town water. Sorry, not in Australia though. Um, Jeff Papaya, how you going mate? I don't even think an air stone would get everything. It says, oh yeah, an air stone. Yeah, because it's the chlorine. The chlorine is the major problem because that kills the microbes, and we're trying to, you know, increase the the microbes are there to break down all of their mineralized substrate material, and even the nutrients to unlock them to make them available through the exudates and the roots in the plants. Yeah, looking on a four stage one. What brand are you using? FSA. Okay. Um, I don't know. Pretty. I can't remember the brand to be honest i've had mine for ages i bought a few of them too so they're all pretty much the same you just have to major thing is get a ppm meter and test it test you into your out there's a little it's a dc10 no what's it called because oh. oh, it's really important uh. DM1 dual TDS meter. And if you do get an RO system, get a DM1, D for dog, M for Mary, one dual system reverse osmosis, um, dual system meter. And that's a, you'll put that into a search and then it'll come up. And that's uh, about 50 bucks, I think. And that has a few inlets. It has an inlet and outlet and it tests your water coming in and water going out. And it gives you the displays saying both. Very handy. So then you know what's up. We got chlorine in our tap water, says Cloudscape. Yep, that's good. 
my EC is like eight, so no mutes. Okay, back to it. Surface tension, how difficult it is to break the interface. Yes. So when you put in, this, it's talking about the molecules that, to attract, the surface tension on here is really hard. It's, it's, it's an actual good layer. If you, you have to put a water, so, a uh, water, so, no, wetting agent in it like yucca or, um, what's the other wetting agent? Anyway, yucca works really well and it softens it up. So like fungus gnats or thrips, so they won't actually, they'll sit on top of it. But if you have that solution wetting agent in your water, they all can't sit on the top of the water and they'll fall through it and drown. It's a really, really important thing, the surface tension. Uh, surface tension responsible for the shape. Yeah, right. We're going into it a bit before. Here we go. The process of pulling water up against gravity in the plant vesicles. Adhesion plants. This is a tension cohesion theory. So it goes in and because the water pressure is higher uh, the water pressure, hang on, I have to show it, because it's seven kilopascals out here and it's lower up here. So because it's lower in the atmosphere and higher down in the roots, it'll want to push it and or pull it outwards. So as it goes through the stomata and evaporates and gets used, it'll those droplets will move up, move up, and that will have to keep moving up throughout the plant. So that's the cohesion tension theory, just a, a really basic run over of it. And the direction of movement through the, the xylem, is that what's showing the arrows because that's a polar direction how it goes from the roots to the shoots where the phloem goes both ways tensile strength uh, okay know the maths not getting into that some compounds form acids and bases right how does water flow out of the cells no that's a that's a cell of a root that's the root hair coming out of it so the water will be sitting around it, so it'll be absorbed through it. And there's, uh, there's three ways it can get through it. There's the symplastic, the apoplastic way, and the trans, trans uh, something way. It's not very common, the trans. So the symplastic is the one that goes through the cells, so it get dissolved and evaporated through the plasma, plasmodus mater in, in the cells, and the apoplastic way movement goes around the cells through the apoplast, which is located out of the cells. The movement in and out, there's three physical imbibition, diffusion and osmosis. Yes, there are the three different ways the water can actually go or it can transfer. Imb oh, I don't want to read all these. That's getting into it. Plants, what? Plants possess high numbers of hydrophilic colloids in the form of proteins and carbs like cellulose, starch, pectins in both living and dead. These substances have a strong attraction towards water. So that's what gives you your tension cohesion theory. Agar, yeah, has a high amount of water. Yep, good. Proteins have high inhibition. Cellulose, all right. Agar, what's that about the root hair? First, the importance of imbibition into plants. The first step of absorption of water through the roots and higher plants is through the root hairs. Imbibition of water is very essential for dry seeds for them to germinate. Ah, oh, Jesus. Moreover, imbibition is increased as follows. Okay, I thought it was going to go into electrolytes of this seed germination. Many desiccant ones, yes. Peristomal teeth movements in moss. Bryophytes, which aren't even cannabis. Um, fungal spores, yes, the water activity level for fungal spores is needed for, so if it's above 65%, and if it's above that, there's a chance that the water, that some fungal spores will germinate. Oh, that's a little test you can do. Effective matrix and reduction. Uh, oh, yeah. Stains. Movements of water through stains. You can see where they move. It's pretty cool. Sugar, yeah. Dissolving substance of water. No, come on. Importance of diffusion. All right, that's it. I'll go back and say good day, see what's up. And then we'll get into the plants with water section. Okay.
Sorry about that. It's been up the whole time. Matt Rob, yes. Yeah, I've been wanting a reverse. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Oh, shit. I'm in tap water pretty sure. Straight. Oh, really? Hey, Ozzy, what's your opinion on spraying stored rainwater on the girls at night? I have been trying it for a couple of weeks and it seems to be good. It depends what's in there, how well it stores, and I know and how clean your tank is. Depends what source you put in there and how many things get absorbed in the water. Like um, if mosquitoes can get in, they can start breeding and they might have a vector for something. They might carry things on them, bacteria and fungal spores that will start and pr proliferate in your side of your rain tank. Um, and also you've got to clean tanks out. So every five or 10 years, you've got to get someone in there and pressure clean it out. Make sure you get rid of all the scum on the sides of all different things that are growing because uh, biologic biological activity puts out a biofilm and it repels most other things. So it'll just really excel so you'll get one or two main species and they will just take over so you've got to clean that so if you've got all these things that are really good um stored rainwater is rad and testing it will tell you so you want to test the ppm because that'll tell you how many particles per million are in there and you don't know what particles they are unless you do further analysis but at least it gives you some idea so if you know if you've got something that's 100 out of your rain tank shit, that's bad but if you've got something that's like um you know 20 30 or something like that you know it's pretty good and then you if you live in the city you're going to get acidic rain so you're going to get a lot of acid acidic residues that are going to be in your rainwater that's coming down too so you might want to filter it before you want to use it but if you're in the country and the rain's pretty good and you're far far away from the cities you'll be right remember the big cumulonimbus clouds they develop in the mountains and move it Quite a few hundred kilometers or you know, even one or two hundred miles to deposit their rains so they can pick up from a city somewhere and deposit it where you are in the country so keep that in mind too watch on the radar where storms develop so you know that's where they're sucking up the convective winds convective yeah convection goes up diversion goes down so the convective layer goes up and then you'll know where what you're going to be getting in your rainwater Thanks for that question, Dave. Good on you, mate. Capillary action. Oh, yeah. He says it's only, it's clean only a month ago. Ah, oh, sweet as. Wow, you got some good stuff then. Um, all right. No more questions. I'll get back to showing some more water stuff. Um... This would be good to look at. This is like a summary of all the water things. Maybe I should show it last. Yeah, I should. Water and life. Aquaporins. They're around the cells. Oh, yeah, not much on it. These are little things that plants rec plant aquaporins are recognized as multifunctional protein transporting water, as well as gases such as CO2, nutrients like boron, silicon, or reactive oxygen species. It's like a little... Oh, cool. It's a little, this is a cell wall here, and it's a little division in the cell wall that allows things to go through it, proteins and nutrients and stuff like that. That's what the aquaporins do, and they're all around the cells. So like, so there, that's a plasmodus mater, but yeah, you see the aquaporins, so that's how the water can travel, and other things go straight through it, little aquaporins there, through the plasma. Molecules, so it's a cell wall, so this is how it goes in. It's giving an example of the uh, water going in and across. So it'll go from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. There we go, from the outside up here to the inside of the cell. So it gets re it's waits for different things to be activated to, before it pulls in because it's just not always open. So it'll get like a calcium signal or some sort of signal that'll go up to it and it'll go, all right, I'll open, then I'll suck that in just to keep homeostasis. All right, aquaporin's done. Um, present. Let's get back to the next one. I'm going to share again. I stopped sharing. It was a shame. <laughs> Let me go back. Root pressure and gutation. No, that'll be last because that's pretty cool. That's real cool. There's probably some stuff. Anyway, I'm not predicting things. Water and life. This is very small. Let's go through this. Water covers. Yes, it does. 
plants and animals well we're 70 percent so this mightn't be a good thing some of this non-body electron pairing okay oh here we go the molecular weight so it's got a slight this is negative 300 and positive 220 so the difference in that creates a slight negative charge giving it a, a slight negative charge for the water molecule right this is an electrostatic attraction between the oxygen atom and one water molecule and the hydrogen of another called the hydrogen bond partial negative charge electrons are pulled towards the oxygen and they'll bond forming yep a partial negative charge so they're pulled pulled slowly in the positives to the negatives and then they'll form as one unit then water's formed and they'll have a net negative charge of about negative 100. then when they bond up this is their form with their 105 degree angle or it's 104.5 i think to be uh, water absorbs a lot of heat before it begins to get hot it is a substance of in, in dissolved in water then the freezing point is lowered a great deal of heat is released into the environment when liquid water changes to ice yes that's Joule's law says that all right I studied um, I'm an amateur meteorologist too I've studied weather it's atmospheric science for many years uh, that's that one aquaporins that one all right we'll do this one and then we're into the last one since oxygen all right and i can skim through this because this is like the best of that i've found for water underwater stress plants produce smaller pubescent leaves to minimize water losses this is leaf adaptations to water stress that was a lecture that come out of oh trick of philly Trichophily is the presence of trichomes or hairs on the leaves or the stems of the plants. So cannabis is trichophily. Philly, what's that mean? Philly in Latin. Um, I can't I remember it. Moment. Leaf rolling shown by grass leaves during water stress to minimize. Oh, yeah, that's into little leaves. Waxy thick cuticle. This is some if you put your cannabis leaf under the microscope and do a side cut of it use a microtome to cut a side slice and <clears throat> you can see if you've got a thick cuticle above the epidermis layer there that's the outside of it then there's the inside of it in the dermal tissue uh, and there's a thick cuticle that means that your plant will is under has been under water stress and it puts this out naturally to combat for that to protect it Puts out see like that there's a waxy cuticle waxy layer so it um, stops it and also another thing for if you've got um, another sign of drought your plants being in drought is having a sunken stomata so if all your stomata are like this so if you do a side cut with the microtome again and put it under the microscope and look at one stoma you'd find that if it's sunken that's the answer oh uh, yeah see there's a sunken stoma in the middle see that's the that's the outside um channels there what are they called the what's that cell called again uh anyway that cell but it's sunken so the stoma is actually sunken when it should be up level so signs of h2o stress in leaves yeah been through that physiological response of plants to water stress drought escapes in the ability of plants to complete to complete the life cycle before severe stress sets in so drought escape is the ability of plants to complete its life cycle before stress sets in so that's why your stress that's why a plant the cannabis plant wants to reproduce itself under stresses so it wants to complete its life cycle before its stresses have killed it so that's why you'll get uh, if the herm tendency is in on your low homozygotic uh, on your high homozygotic variety where it's um, not very stable uh, you'll that's what the happens and it shrinks too 
So all of the cytoplasm that's inside of the cell here will shrink and it won't be won't function as it wants to. It won't flow, flow freely. So all of those plast like the sim the simplastic way of water movement with aquaporins, etc., as it goes through for plasmodus mater and stuff, it won't um, be very flowing because of that, as you can see the difference there. This has got a pressure in it, it's very nice. This has got internal pressure, so it won't work well. Water stresses, uh, yeah. mild drought stress leads to tenfold increase in endogenous abscisic acid concentrations, both in case of higher and lower plants. So, yes, that's a way to induce drought resistance into your cultivar is to do just this. You would give it a vinegar substance and it would act as an abscisic acid and it does the same thing. Drought stress causes signal perception followed by signal transduction that results in gene expression. So it does alter the genes. So that's with your epigenetics. That's its pathway for your epigenetics from drought stress. This is how it actually works with the actual protein, um, with the, the genes that are involved. Oh, that's a protein, yep. I'm not going to go through that. It's too technical. Cal module and binding proteins. Yep, that was. Remember from the mimosa leaf, you'll touch a leaf, and then it'll activate calcium, and that calcium signal sends it to this cal modulin, which bonds to the peptide, and then continues its signal, which will end up shutting the leaves. Water scarcity is one of the major limitations for plant productivity, and elicits a range of responses at morphological, anatomical, physiological, and molecular levels. So we've looked at a few of them already. Molecular we've looked at inside of the cells, <coughs> how they've shrunk in the different cell pathways. Physical, we've like the physical, the, the visuals that you'll see from drought stress when it wilts, or like the mimosa leaf with its different signaling, um, anatomical and morphological. Well, that's where it grows. So as it morphs, it grows it will produce different outcomes from its signals that it's already been given. So if it's drought resistant, it'll probably just grow runty and not very good and maybe stress out too much. It's its angle. 19 grams per mole. Let's make it note. That's for water at 25C, the heat evaporation. Oh yeah, there's a 44 kilojoules per mole. The heat releases when it evaporates. So when it changes from a solid into, no, from a liquid into a gas that's at 25 Celsius or room temperature, which is uh, 75 Fahrenheit odd, that's what you get. Anyway, we're not going into, I don't want to go into this detail. That's how water moves, that's the water cycle. So rain comes in, gets infiltrated through groundwater and it slowly gets out through evaporation through and evapotrans and transpires through the plants so evaporates through the you know you can get um i've got an evaporation meter and it's you get mostly more evaporation than you do rainfall so that's why the lands are very dry in australia and in canada for instance i was getting more rainfall than evaporation and that's why it's more heavier in the ground Ah, uh, that's the water pathways, solid liquid gas. Maximum density, yep, we spoke about that one. Oh, this, cool, this is a bit blurry, but this shows you the actual pressure. So that sigma minus 30 is the pressures inside of the cells. So this is a, a root hair. Now it's, is that the root hair? That's soil, water, root hair. There's the root hair there. Oh, yep. Yeah. So that's the root hair there, endodermis, the pericycle inside. Oh, that's the vial. That's the flow. That's the xylem. The flow. I'm sorry. In the pericycles, cells. Anyway, that's not really lower epidermis. That's not too clear. So I don't want to talk about that. Plant cell. Sort of spoke a bit about that. I think turgor is pressure. So if its pressure is lower, the turgicity will be lower and it'll close, and the stoma, stoma will close. Guard cells, that's what I was thinking before. 
damn it, the kidney shaped cells, guard cells. But yeah, when water's lower, it'll close. So water goes out of the guard cells and it tends to relax them where when water goes into it, it's, it goes turgid and it opens. Classification of plant water requirements, hydrophytes, xerophytes and mesophytes. No, that's nothing to do with cannabis, sorry. Water potential in reference state, pure water is arbitrary assigned to a value of zero megapascals. Water movement from, I can go into irrigation engineering actually. I'll show you some rad stuff in there. All right, we're not gonna get into this. This is a technical, turgid cell. Yep, full up with pressure, it's very good. Works well. And it's pathway C. When it's full with water, it's expanding. It wants to push water, keep it going through the aquaporins, plasma, and the other channels that it has. Plasma dismatters and things. Look at the flaccid cell. It's got it's the opposite. So it's just crap, like we spoke about before. No water can go through it. It shrinks. Loss of shape. No turga pressure. 10 metre, 30 feet vertical distance translates into 0.1 megapascal change in water potential. So for this tree here, which is that high, that's how much of a distance it gets. So for your cohesion tension theory, this is pretty cool like for to get into the mass because the atmosphere is really low and the roots should be higher, like about seven megapascals should be in the roots. And you go up here to about three in your hypercotyl, then you go up higher again and it gets lower and lower to the atmosphere. And then it should real that's how you get your the pressure for your xylem to transfer the water what's this we sort of talked about aquaporins uh, turga pressure yeah pure water has zero uh, i don't know what that's referring to water in the roots move by three pathways oh yeah the apoplast symplast and the, oh, it's transmembrane see i remember couldn't remember the membrane bit but yeah the three thing it's rare it's mostly these two so around the cells or through the cells soil water oh so there's five ways through soil water can can be gravitational water capillary water hydroscopic water runaway water and chemically combined water so gravity water just goes straight through. It percolates or inf inf infiltrates, goes down. Capillary water gets binded by something else. So it might be in the soil and it might touch another thing and, and get pulled towards it. Hydroscopic water means water that can't be can't move. It's not hydros hydrophobic. No, hydroscopic means it can move. Oh, that must be just leached away then. Runaway water is leached. Chemically combined water. So it might be held up the h2o molecule might be held up with other molecules that make it harder to release it make it the like chloramine you know increase the bonds the hydrogen bonds or something physical pathways of water movements in plants spoke about them oh this oh, here you go it explains more so apoplast is around the cells symplast is through the cells and transmembrane is both which is doesn't, you know, there's not much happened with the transmembrane route. Pathways of water movements in plants. Oh, yep, yeah, this is just a visual of it going through the plant. So this is out through, it's the root hair, which it comes out. So it'll get sucked in through the root hair, through its cohesion tension theory, and it'll get moved through, through the plant over here, and it's trying to get to the vascular bundle, which is the vascular cindal, which is the xylem. And the phloem so it's trying to get into them because that's where the pressure is lower so the pressure will be higher here and it'll be a bit lower here so it forces it into here where it's needed and it'll keep moving and do it to go through its other pathways that it's needed up to that absorption so water can get through the leaves through the dermal layers and it can get there's a few different um there's hydrothodes that are also in the outsides nectothodes we don't have there's lenticels, we don't have lenticels. There's other dermal tissue that it can get absorbed through, through that transmembrane way. So there's, you can feed through exterior, through the plants, through uh, foliar ways. 
active absorption of water by roots will help the me metabolic energy generated by root respiration. This is a reason why I don't use VPD. So a VPD, vapor, vapor pressure deficit, has high atmospheric moisture. So if it's high outside, this won't happen because the pressure will be lower in the plants. More than 95% of water absorbed by the root system is operated by passive forces like DPD, gradient created by transpirational pull, DEPA, pressure depurization. So that's, it's similar to a VVD, but this is a deprivation, deprivation deficit. Uh, the rhizosphere is a zone. The rhizosphere is a zone immediately next to the root surface, with its neighbouring soils. In this zone, there's close interactions with plants and microbes, but we're mainly interested in the water. So, if you've got a high water around the roots or in the rhizosphere, that means you're going to get your cohesion tension theory happening. So, by keeping it dry there, you're not going to favour that cycle. So that's why drip systems are very, very beneficial because they work like this, where if you have long times between waterings, there's a high chance your rhizosphere will be dry, slowing down this transpiration, this root cohesion theory, and the water movement through your plants. Factors affecting the rate of water absorption are external and environ or environmental and internal factors. There's heaps of them, sort of run through a few of them already. If the amount of water in the soil or your substrate is between its field capacity and permanent wilting percentage or permanent wilting point, the rate of water absorption remains more than or less uniform, which is good. So your field capacity is your rate where water overflows, where if you've got a, a pot, for instance, it'll flow out of the top or it's just flowing, running out and leaching everything out. Permanent wilting point is when you see it wilting, and that's when it's reached there's zero water around the rhizosphere of all of the rhizosphere, so not one bit of root has it. So it's just real wilting because there's no pressure, so therefore it'll wilt. So that's how that explains that bit. The decrease in soil water below permanent wilting point causes decrease in absorption. Yes. If the soil water increases much beyond field capacity, that's when it floods. Air pores between soil particles filled with water. Yes, water absorption stops. So your air, so for the plant to get oxygen out of the water, which it gets oxygen through the root system, it's 10,000 times slower to pull air out of the water than it is to get out of the air, out of the atmosphere. So if you've got too much water in your substrate that's constantly around it, with no oxygen or very little, that's going to limit the growth in the plant because it's, remember, it's 17 essential nutrients with two floating nutrients, quasi ones. But the 17 essential and the first three ones are hydrogen, CH and O, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, which they make up 95% of the plant's nutrient requirements. So 45% for oxygen and 45% carbon, and then there's 5% for the hydrogen. So if you've got 40% requirements for the plants and you're blocking it with water permanently, that's going to very, you're going to get some bad results. So that's why people with um, their, they'll put their roots in water permanently, but they put an air stone in there too. Soil aeration. Water absorption is doing more effectively in well aerated soil. Yes, for that reason that I just explained. Optimum temperature for maximum rate of water absorption is 20 to 30 Celsius. So it's at, at 70 Fahrenheit to 82 Fahrenheit, I think. Don't quote me. 70, yeah, 68. Transpiration. That's when the rate of water is almost directly proportional to the rate of absorption. So the amount that it absorbs to the amount that it leaves. Yay. Been through that. I'm going to read a fair bit now because I know I've left something and we've just got the one thing to go through. See, so is there any questions? I'll use that. I'll use an air stone. Yep, looking at a four stage. Hey, Aussie. I got a different question. Here we go. I'm having, Matt Flick says, I'm having trouble with the water with white moths. 
how can I get rid of them? White moths, they're so bad. Um, what are they? White fly, I think they call them. Um, so you, there's a biological for white fly. You get that, which is... Uh, Montarenesis is good for the leaves, and then hypoaspis. Actually, I'll pull up a chart for you, Mick. Uh, Matt Flick, I'll pull up a chart for you, mate, just so I'm not guessing. Um, I've still got to finish that one. And I'll finish that. That's good. Just crossing heaps of stuff off. Now I'm going to go back and look into my soil chart. I know I've got one. Microbe stuff. Microbes should be in here. There it is. Bug poster. So I'll share my screen. You can help out too. I hope it's on there. I'll just have a quick look. There it is. <laughs> that sucks me to get to to get the poster up, and it's not um, not quite there. Anyway, present share screen. Bug poster. So in here, uh, look across the top, white fly, here you go. These are the things you got to hope. Does it look like this, mate? A little mothy, because they do look like a moth. So you want your Montedurenesis, they're rad. They just fix everything. Did you know that their body, the back of the color, the changes for different things? Like if, you eat, if they eat rusted mites, they go red. They're really cool. Never use those either ones. Oh, there's a parasitic wasp, Ecarsia, Encarsia, parasitic, parasitic wasp. E-R-E-T-M-O-C-E-R-U-S -E 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 is another beneficial for getting rid of white flies. But just get monodurenesis. Actually, no, I shouldn't say what you got because it depends on how much of an infestation you have. If you see more than four things, four white flies flying at one time, you have an infestation. I would suggest get nearly all of them or at least get mont and the Eret Moseris. I would at least get them too, which will cost you about 100 bucks. Uh, and if you haven't got an infestation, you might just be all right with Montgerenesis, and they're only uh, maybe 50 bucks delivered for a big canister of it. So I hope that works for you, my friend. There's, I might as well just put the quick thing up, quick chart up. Just for people that got any bug problems, saying, oh, look, I can get some trigger grammar, or I can get some... Um, but Montedurenesis does pretty much for everything. It's really rad. Thrips are hard. And I so if you have thrips, cucumerous. Cucumerous? Yes. Definitely, definitely. Spider mites, Prosimilus, Californicus. I mean, they're really easy to get rid of. Broad mites, rusted mites, a bit harder. What, anyway, this is a water topic, sorry. I hope that helps, mate. Get back to it. Age every day, it's happening. Guard sale, see? Raymond knew, I was trying to guess it, and he said, um, Raymond just pumps it in, and he knew. Good on you. Cheers, Matt. Love these shows. Thanks for your support. Jevery Day. Uh, I lack turga, turga in my billies. Tells me it's time for a... <laughs> that's pretty funny. Hey, cool, and Luke, how's it going? Your average house pressure pump would struggle to get water to the top of that tree. Uh, Yes, yes, that's like why I don't get why they like RH in the tents so high or doses it makes toxicity issues. Yes, oh, cabbage moth. Okay, says Raymond. I just got a new bottle of neem. I'm ready to use it. Oh, good work. Neem is so, so beneficial. Most of my studies are from India, and India is a major supplier of neem. And um, so a lot of my topics end up into neem and as a directin, which is that's the main constituent in it. It's so beneficial, so organic, really good. Hey, Monty, how you going, mate? Yeah, money crop one. That's got bot botanicals in it, pure crop one. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, pure crop one. 
Luke, Monty, yes, g'day, g'day. Water pressure. Water can be an issue with pests. Yes, I was speaking about that earlier with surface tension, uh, how they can't penetrate the surface tension. They won't go through it. So what you do, you put in a wetting agent like yucca and it releases the surface tension so things can get in. Like if you're killing thrips, I used to love them. They don't, I'd put a little bit of that in and go and touch it and it touch one of them and they just suck right in and they drown within about probably three, five seconds. They drown really, really fast, but they sit on top of the water molecule if you don't have that in it. So yeah, it's really, really, water's important, breaking that surface tension sometimes. You can only apply neem three times a week in veg. Now, who says that? Depends what, if you can take it. I've put it on a bit more than that, I'm sure in the past. But yeah, it depends what dosage rate, if you've got to make it really strong, I suppose to, to get rid of something real fast. Like in the past I've sprayed um, uh, ISO on the plant, you know, and that was in one of my experiments that I've shown on the video. And, but you just have to remove it fast. So you want it to stay on there, kill things, and within two minutes, remove it. See, so, yeah, many ways to do many things. Now what? Oh, that's right, it's aquaporin. No. That's right, it was the last topic I remember for today, which is root pressure and gutation. Do you know what that is, gutation? <clears throat> you will soon. It's cool. Uh, proponents of the theory state that the vital capacity of the living cells in res is responsible for the accident of the sat, okay, whatever. All right, vital force theory. Oh, these are different theories for water movement in plants, but it's the cohesion tension theory that actually sticks. So I'm not going to, that's the past. There's a pulse movement. There's a test that you can do for tests. We're not going to talk about that. Root pressure, physical force theory, atmospheric theory. Yeah, it's, where's the rad one you can test? Yeah, here's the one. You put a glass tube on top. So you tell what sort of pressure you got. So root pressure is a transverse osmotic pressure within the cells of a root system that causes sap to rise through the plant stem of the leaves. So you can do an experiment to see what you've got. So once you're harvesting, cut the stem off and then stick this, this is a clear glass tube over the top, but it's got to fit in either side. So you've got to make sure it's right. Then you put a bit of water in it and then you see what happens. Does the water go up or does the water go down? And that's just the pressure from the roots so if you go and water it after that, you find that that should probably go up because there's a pressure difference how it's higher in the roots and lower up here. So that should go up. So that's sort of just proving root pressure theory. The cause of it. Root pressure causes, we've, I've gone on about that. Oh, it's, root pressure occurs in this island and in some vascular plants when the soil moisture level is high either at night or when transpiration is low during the day. Two ways the water can get out. Cause of the root pressure, okay. Significance, root pressure can transport water and dissolve mineral nutrients from roots through the zone to the tops. Modern concept, the use of root pressure. Root pressure helps in establishing continuous chains of water molecules in the zone. Transport. Uh, down the bottom, this pressure pushes the water up through the small top to small heights. Root pressure is associated with the phenomenon of gutation. So when you see gutation, that means that the atmosphere is too high outside and the water can't evaporate. So when there is a high soil moisture level, when water at the roots, because the water potential of the roots is lower in the soil solution, the water will accumulate in the plant, creating a root pressure. The root pressure forces some water to exude through special structures called hydrothodes or water glands. And I've got some rad photos of cannabis hydrothodes in action. Coming up, cutation fluid may contain a variety of organic and inorganic compounds. Yes, so if you taste it, that's why if you taste flow and sap, I've got a thing of what the flow and sap constituents are. It's got all sorts of minerals and sweeteners um, in there. Oh, cutation liquid solution slightly acidic containing many minerals such as nitrates, salts, like sodium, potassium. 
magnesium, manganese, so, um, sodium, I said so, that's sulfur, not sodium, <laughs> aluminium, chlorine, hexoses, and even enzymes like catalase, MLAs, peroxidase, or on drying, it forms a white crust which remains on the leaf surface. So if you see that, you know it's from mutation from the atmosphere um, being too high, so the waters couldn't evaporate. And the hydrothodes, they're the cells that are like stomata, the stomata in your plants. They're located on the, at the outside, on the epidermal layers, and they're just another way of the plant breathing. Uh, hydrothodes are made of many groups of cells. Uh, these cells are called epithem cells, open and cut, and famous bees in turn communicate with the exterior through an open water source through open water stoma or they're like a stoma pore, yeah, open pore. So that's why people say, does foliar work? Well, here you go. This is how it gets into the plant. It gets in through dermal tissue and dermal layer, through the transmembrane pathways. It gets in through hydrothodes and stoma, or is all the stomata. One is a stoma, multiple stoma are called stomata. So it gets in through all these different ways in cannabis. Gutation is the exudation of water droplets of xylem sap on the tips of the edges in plants like such as cannabis. Mutation is not to be confused with dew, which condenses from atmosphere on the leaf plant surface. So you're only going to see in cannabis mutation on the edge leaf tips. If you see it in the center, that means it's dew formed. So see on all of these leaf tips here, that's from the hydrothodes. This is to prove fungal resistant. My genetics is fungal resistant. Notice how only dead cells have fungal hyphae growing, where live cells that are above 90% humidity, it can't penetrate. It's awesome. So that's why you'll see this dead. You go, what's this brown shit? It's actually rad. <laughs> so that's what happens. That's what I've done, installed fungal resistance into my genetics. And that is not powdery mildew. That's what it looks like. Powdery mildew would look like that on the top of the leaves. Did you know you can get a UV torch and you stick it on it at night and it'll glow so you'll know if it's PM. And underneath the leaves, if it looks like that, it's downy mildew. But that's not it. I don't know what it is. Here's some other gutations. So you can see how it's all through the hydrothodes, which are located at the tips. And like, like, see, it's, it's the stem pressure testing before about the pressure of the stem. So it was cut off, and you'll see how it exudes out because I've got good root pressure inside. That's just to prove root pressure theory. You can do it as well. See? Some more hydrothodes. That's a better shot. See, they're all on the edges. <clears throat> on, these are the leaf tips of the leaf margins, and we have serrated leaf margins in cannabis. You want to get into the botany of it so that's where they are located so you can see it's in a clone little clone machine so inside of the clone machine if you ever see the cutation you know that you have sufficient roots because your root pressure is big enough to uh, pull the water in to create it high enough in the plants where it can't get out so if you ever see this in your clones you just know assume don't have to look at the roots shit i've got a bloody transplant it's a good way of telling that mutation. And that concludes today. So I hope today that was a really, really good water topic, actually. That fully went through it. What induces mutation? Uh, that, uh, oh, sorry, I'd better go up. Monty. What bottle says? Oh, that's what the bottle says. Yeah, the bottle says heaps of stuff, mate. You can dilute it. You can strengthen it up. Uh, they just put the recommended dose because if people go and put on um, more than what they say in their plants die, they can sue them and there's all sorts of legal problems. So they've really, in, I'm naturally, what? I'm naturally cautious with sprays. Good on you. Cool hand, Luke. So you should be, mate. I try not to use them too. I'll try and go with botanicals first, biological control, because um, that's a good way of building up the plant genetics anyway. Because if you want to keep them, the genetics going, you want the plant to be a bit resistant and it can handle its own self. 
So good on you, mate. You'd have some really good cannabis. G'day, Terence. How are you, mate? Basically, hydro hydraulic pressure. Hydraulic pressure, I suppose. I don't know what that is. Hydraulic pressure is using a machine to build up hydraulic pressure, isn't it? But whatever way you interpret it, it's your way. What's he doing? Oh, he's doing some of that. Very good. Hey, Monty. I've never seen gutation. You have now, cool and Luke's cool, eh? That looks mouldy. Yeah, that was the. Uh, he would have been talking about those white dots. So he pulled it out right. So it was a good diagnosis, mate. It would have been under the light that I had. It would have been some overspray or some sort of dots because the moulds would have grown because it was in the ninety percent humidity. So that would have um, fully gone out and exasperated. Because mold, mold likes, I think, 80% 80, 80 humidity. So in that chamber was 90. So it really would have put, pumped it. How are you going, Chris White? Yum, yum, cloudscape. I've seen gutation on buds, but not on leaves. On, oh, okay. That's what Monty says. I've never seen that. What, oh, here we go. What induces gutation? Um, well, it's the pressure the root pressure and the high excellent question because i can go to my i know there's a section now i got i'm sure i got one in micro irrigation engineering so we're finished for that today i'll go into water or is it in here is that it there no that's chemicals there's i've got a root pressure to show you the different pressures inside there it is Sweet. All right. This is a really good bloody show today. Present. I'm just sharing the screen to show you. Oh, just entire screen. I don't know where it is. This one. So this is, okay, atmosphere is 100. Negative 100. So remember, pure water has a zero potential. So as it goes down, it re reduces. So the soil is higher. So this is all these figures are negative, remember? So you've got a higher pressure here, and then it's going fuller into the negative. So it means it's getting lower up out here. So that's why it can move. That's why the water potential gradient has is high in these circumstances. And this shows you what the soil is, what the trunk or the down near the hypocotyl, and then the leaf cells are a bit higher at one. So the soil is 0.33 negative megapascals. The trunk or the stem will be, or the hypocotyl, will be 0 0.8 megapascals. The leaf cells, as you go a bit higher, is negative 1 megapascals. The leaf area around the outsides of the leaf is negative 7 megapascals, and the atmosphere is negative 100 megapascals. So this is showing the water potential, how it can be relocated. Uh, I think that's all for that bit. I'll show you micro irrigation engineering actually because that's all for the questions yeah all right i'll show you some micro irrigation engineering plant science because that was pretty cool and i'm sure in that oh that was more about feeding so i don't know if i should get into that um but it's, it is relevant feeding all right I'll so we've still got 10 minutes to go to the hour. Where is that course? micro irrigation engineering. Here we go. So I'll just share my screen. Present share screen. Uh, no. micro irrigation engineering. Oh, shit. There's this many of them. 60 lectures. That was a hard course too. There was so much bloody maths in it, and I'm not very good at maths, algebra stuff. I'll just show some slides, see what we got here. Soil water terms using irrigation scheduling. So field capacity, when it overflows, gravitational water is when it's free to grain from gravity. Capillary water is when it's stored in pores and when it can be added by capillary action when it touches each other from surface tension. Permanent wilting point is when it um, wilts from lack of water. Plant available, maximum allowable depletion 
readily available water. No, infiltration rate is percolation rate, same thing. Plants are wilted because of water. So when they're saturated, they will wilt from over too much water. Permanent wilting point will be wilting from also too much because here they can't breathe and get oxygen. So that's why putting you in a, in a room with no oxygen, you'd be doing the same. So you want to try and keep in between the field capacity, which is max, and the permanent wilting point, which is none. So there's an area in the middle where you want to try and stay to, for good root pressure and for good root air exchange and mineral exchange. That's what this, this chart's getting to. Methods based. Uh, this is a technical course. Microirrigation engineering goes right into it, so I'm going to skim across a lot. That's cool. I really want one of them. They're a potometer, they're called, and you can measure the potential of the leaves in, in field. Exuding sap. Ah, operation schedule. Soil water balance. No, we're not going to do any math stuff. Full irrigation. Deficit irrigation. This is a good one. This shows you the amounts of water that percolates through the soil. So you've got to develop your substrates so you roots are going to go down to the levels that you want. Because see down here, by normal watering, you're not going to get down to 10% reaches there, 20% reaches there, 30% there, and 40% or 50, you know, gets easily to the tops. Where cannabis plants, they only grow in the top section, zero to 60 centimeters. Mostly, if you grow trees, it goes lower. Advantage of irrigation, soil water management. These are different ways to test it and how to do it. Tensiometers, okay. These are different ways to measure your soil. There's capacitive, I'll talk about two. The resistive meters, which is the gypsum ones, um, or the capacitive meters, which is the ones I use. The gypsum ones, they require a lot of calibration. So I'm not into calibration, so that's why I don't use them. And they're a little bit more expensive, I've found, too. It says here inexpensive, but for my setups, they're a little bit more expensive because I've got these capacitive ones, which they're exactly like that. They've got a V. So there's a one probe there, hollow in the middle, one probe there, and it measures the difference between it, which gives you your reading out, which you can pull a number off it and puts it onto a digital display. Um, yeah, that's, I've used one of them for many years. It just more so helps to dial your stuff in and also to know your pot and your plant because your cultivar might drink more, your substrate might be made up shit, so you haven't got enough aeration or you've got too much aeration. So it could be holding on, you could have too much organic matter or farmyard manure, which will just hold on to the water. So there's all different ways where you can learn it. Another advantage for having this is in flush time. I like to, because the plants don't drink much when they're finishing as much, so you'll... No, oh, sometimes I can give it an extra day between uh, waterings when I'm doing in the flush phase and it's finishing. Electronic. Yes, remote sensing, plant water monitoring. Yes, it's so, well, you know why. It's, I don't have to read what, tell you why. Pressure training, it's a few different reasons why. Cryoscopic. Yes. Measuring, no, orifice meters. Uh, isn't that funny, eh? You put an orifice meter in your pipe, that is, to measuring how it goes through irrigation. Actually, I'll get to the water wetting patterns. Irrigation efficiency. Yes, irrigation use efficiency is a major thing. So that's what we want to try and dial in. We want to get our irrigation efficiency very high. There are all different ways to water it. This is how to work it out extremely efficiently. These are old school ways of irrigating. So back in the day, they had a, a meter, a big long bit of timber lump there with a rock on it, and it helped them lift it out of the big long well and spun it around. So they called a counterpoised or the don. He had a, a foot on his one thing, lifted it up. Once this filled, it lifted, it filled with water, lifted it, it flowed into the bucket. Chain pump, you can also get an old school way where it just flows up through the chain. They have little as a suction pipes on there, and it pulls it up. An endless way is similar. These are pump styles. I just want to go into the use efficiency. 
water quality indicators. Yes, that's something to really keep in mind. Your salinity is your amount of salts that you have too high. So I spoke about that a fair bit, which this can touch on. This is a chart that has the too high. So if your EC is above two, no, that's, you know, you're touching on high salinity. Be careful. When your EC gets above four or three, you're in trouble. That's when it's too high and the plant and the cannabis plant can't function. These are the PPM ratings. So your high salinity is above 2,000 PPM. When it gets above about 2,500 PPM, you're in big trouble. You're, you're going to start and stress the plant out from too many salts being in there. You're trying to, you have to flush it and then test your substrate, test your runoff, see what PPM it is. If it's, when it falls back to 1,500 or 2,000, then you're right. Potentials, yeah. Well, anyway, and sodic sodicity it's having too much sodium in your soil, so your sodium absorption ratio will be very high, and you don't want that because you don't want this, it's too much sodium, which is sodium in your substrate because it blocks out a fair bit of shit. It holds a, it has a positive cation and it holds um, a cation a position up, I suppose you could say. Water classes, no. There's a difference between your sodicity and your salinity. So your saline soil has actually, I'm not going into that. Soil sodic and saline are related, but not the same thing. Yeah, because sodic is sodium and saline is salts reduced to, um, to a lot of things like down here. Salts, free salts, all the cations, all of the anions, and these are just examples. And your cations and your double layer they hold up position. So your salt sits there where it should be potassium sitting there. It should be mag magnesium. Uh, so that's why you don't want too much salt in your substrate. It, it hogs all the positions in your cation position, having a positive charge. Leaching process of adding sufficient water to reduce or dissolve your salts. So that's by you're putting it through it and then you test your runoff and then it wants to be below your two and a half, about 2000 PPM in medical cannabis. Uh, what's this normal piece? And there are there are cultivars that they're called um, what's that word? What's the word when they're salt tolerant, like mangroves? They are a so and so species, a hydrophilic. No, it's water loving. Um, Salt loving is, me oh, what's the microbe that does it? It's a halo, halophyte, a halophyte, I'm pretty sure. That's a salt loving variety. Yes, it is. That comes off memory, so I actually don't quote that. But so that's what they're talking. If you've got a halophyte, or you can actually make your cannabis more tolerant by increasing the epigenetics in a breeding cycle, if you want to try and do that, if you've got a salt, if you've got a problem, or you want to do it. It's possible if you amend it. No, I'm not talking about that. This is to reduce pH, not iron toxicity. No, there's too much ions in there. No, I'm not talking about clogging of emitters. No, it's basically just calcium, heaps of calcium and carbonates and stuff. Where's there's a there's a cool little advantages. Here we go. This is talking about before the ways of watering. So if you're going to, there's wilting point and field capacity is up here. So you want to keep going down and just with it, this is what a drip system does. It doesn't keep it at field capacity. So this is drawn a little bit wrong. So I've explained this a few times. It's, I don't agree with what it said. Field capacity should be a bit higher, but what it, it's just the practices that I'm trying to get out, which what happens with the methods. So if you do your drip method is up here, your sprinkler method is down here and your surface methods down here so every day they're dripping so it's keeping it very the root pressure high so sprinkler method every here every five days they're sprinkling so the root pressure gets comes down to here and it gets reduced so there's a chance where it's not at its maximum so if you can maybe do it every two days and do a little amount it might get this graph higher getting it back to where the mutation, sorry, the root pressure will be higher, allowing the plant to relocate minerals and possibly get advantages because it can get what it needs faster. 
Then the surface method, this person's done it every 10 days. You can see it, look how far it goes nearly to a wilting point. So that's just your different watering methods that will allow you to keep the pressure up in the plant. So your medical cannabis plants can get most benefit out of the translocation of the movement of the minerals and water that it needs and hormones and all that sort of enzymes and proteins, all the stuff that it needs can happen by this process. Now this goes into a hardcore detail about, oh no, this is a method to show, oh, it's showing that if you put your underground dripper here, the roots will grow towards it and then it'll show you just the roots growing towards it basically different layouts on how to design your systems. Wetting patterns. So if you water your soil and if it's in a clay area, which is bad, it'll sit on the top. If it's in a loamy area, like a good mixture, it'll sweep. If it's in a sandy area, it all goes. Stored water. So stored water, see how it's a loamy sort of soil here? So it's very nicely stored. Where if it was clay, it would be stored up the top and sandy, it would be all leached and out the bottom. So you've got to make sure you have a good substrate um, enables a good water holding capacity, like farmyard manure and soil organic matter. Computing, no. Expanding, righto, heaps of maths. Lateral, emitters, this is just different layouts to do your systems, different ways, taps. They made some pretty cool ones in this course. Fertigation versus fertilization. Fertigation is putting in chemicals or the minerals required for the plants into your irrigation system. Fertilization is where you just apply it to the substrates. And to do fertigation, it's pretty technical. You need to make sure that the minerals don't bind with each other. So you've got to use right minerals. Gives you See, this is a drip irrigation system where it see how it's got a lot of root hairs coming out, allowing for more absorption of the water and minerals. And it can speak more to the microbes. It has a better bunch. So that's zoomed in. Look at that. Over here, you've just got a normal method of irrigating or sprinkling, watering. And then you can see the root hairs are very low because it's lateral roots because this has a chance to dry out. So it's got to expand and look for pathways to absorb the nutrients. So it hasn't, where well, this one, it's all given to it, so it just expands within itself. Of course, these little root hairs, it doesn't have to put energy into growing roots. It puts more energy into growing shoots, so you're going to get a better yield as well with this system. You might get better roots with this one, but it's because it's looking for water. All right, my hands are sore. This is different ways to feed it. Oh, that's a good chart. My hands are mega sore. Sorry. Stop sharing. That's it for today. I'm really sore. Bucket. Nice. Good. We're finished. G'day, Kemet. 432. How are you? All right. That was today's show. Hope everybody liked it. There's no more questions coming through. Water. Very important, as you've seen. Shit, an hour 20. Geez, I can go on. So, see, imagine a breeding topic. I'd be talking for hours just by myself, let alone if Frank or, you know, someone else was up here. Full on. So um, I hope you enjoyed today's. It's keep in mind for topics for the next few weeks because I've got no topic for next week. So it's going to be an open topic. I'll be sitting here waiting for your questions. So if you've got any questions, please save them for next week. And I'd love to show my slides from my agricultural engineering and my medical cannabis slides to help you out and to get the words and the points across. So it's clear in your head, not just in mine. So thank you, everybody today for rocking up and listening and supporting me. I do appreciate it. If I didn't talk about the, actually, yes, the subscription, the little things down the bottom, that subscription button is for, uh, it's support is the first button and that's for, I think, five or 10 bucks per month. And then the next one down is $80 and that's for, sharing my links that I've got private links in my YouTube for different other courses that I haven't put up there, more advanced ones, plant science and breeding. And the next one up is for the persons that might want some medical help. I can do a, a video call and help you through it. And then the last one 
was a weekly video call maybe aimed at someone who's trying to get a medical license or set up a medical cannabis uh, prop property or you know program where i could help in that ways so pass that on to the people other people and you know it's all helping so i appreciate it because i don't really get much back in this industry well yes anyway i'm waiting for my next um legal opportunities to come available because i don't do any legal things illegal things so i appreciate all your help and to the couple of people that have subscribed i haven't shouted your name out because i thought you want to be private but i really appreciate your help thank you very much it does help me uh yeah that's about it so it's good on yous so dave says great show again i hope everyone has a great day thanks dave good on you Vin, Vin says the same, and Cool Hand Luke says the same. Good stuff. Appreciate your support. Rick F. Rick James says the same thing. Hey, Rick. Nice to see you, mate. You're just at the end of a pretty very in-depth water topic on plants and water, on how the effects of water goes with plants and what its processes are, and etc. So it was good today. Thank you, everybody. So I see you all next time, next week, in seven days' time. So save your topics up because I don't have one. It's an open topic. So we'll talk about something to do with medical cannabis in seven days' time. Thanks again. Leave a like, says Cool and Luke. Thanks, mate. See you all. Happy breeding, happy growing, and good health to you all. See ya. Bye-bye, mates.